Would you get up for Pastor Mike Ostinger? Hello. Thank you, CFNI. It is so good to be on this stage with you. Uh, I just want to acknowledge a few people in the room before I move forward with anything. Um, tonight is senior night, and so if you are a senior in high school, if you're in high school, would you just raise your hand so we know who's in here? Just want to show some love to you for coming out. Hey, thank you so much for joining us. If you are a part of the YFN family, would you also raise your hand? I want to show some love. Come on, let's go. Listen, listen, just to, to brag right now on YFN, it is a, if you don't know anything about it, we started in 1990 by Mama Lindsay herself, who had a dream to make sure that there was a youth expression here at Christ for the Nations to reach young people. And so if we're 32 years young, and we are about to host camp in exactly 48 days, right here in this room. I'm gonna tell you right now, we have five weeks of camp coming. Four of those five weeks are completely full. And that, the number of teenagers that will be coming on this campus in 48 days is 3,955 that are already signed up. And it's just, just being here, it's very reminiscent to previous years that we've been here. I've been here for, I've been at CF and I for 10 years. And I've been doing YFN for seven. And it, just being right here, I'm reminded of moments very similar to this one, night services, sessions, where I remember one time we were in the middle of worship and there was a young girl who started screaming right over here by the stage. And my first thought was someone cast out this critter because we got a demon. And I was just like, we gotta get an extra, you know, just go ahead, you know, just work on this. And so I look at my team, I'm like, someone please just talk to her. And uh, they get over there and she's like, screaming, screaming. And I don't wanna, ah! And I was like, oh my gosh, please, someone. And she begins to scream, they're gone, they're gone, they're gone. I'm like, praise God, all right, the demon's left, Shaba. And she, we go in to talk to her, and she begins to say that she had scars on her arm from self-harm from years. And in worship, she looks at her arm, and all the scars from the self-harm are completely gone. It just disappeared in a moment of in God's presence. I remember just moments where teenagers would walk forward in the middle of worship without there being someone to prompt it. They just begin to lay marijuana, vapes, condoms, pills on the stage and then begin to walk away. And I don't know about you, but I wanna be a part of something where teenagers walk in one way, but they're walking out another way. It's just, and so like being here right now, I'm just reminiscent because I feel like that same spirit that prompted moments like that is here tonight. And regardless of what you walked in with or what you walked in without, I believe God is gonna meet you right where you're at. I believe it is his nature to do so. And so I just, I get excited in moments like this because I'm reminded of God, who God is and what he's done. And I believe he's gonna do something profound tonight. Are you with me? Who's here? Oh, no, 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 listen. I know, I know it's t &E, but I'm gonna bring a little bit of YFN here tonight. And there's, some, there's something that I need you to know, regardless of your disposition towards youth ministry or YFN, there's a phrase that we have that we will die by, and it's this, a quiet church is a, a quiet church is a, listen, we believe that anything that's healthy has a sound. Anything that's healthy is going to have something. When, it, when they want to find out, are you alive? They're going to look for what? Your heartbeat. They want to know, is there a sound coming from within you that tells us this person has life? So shouldn't the church of God be the loudest thing in the world that we would be able to gather? To, oh, no, see, you're not getting it. Listen, what's, see, what's a matter right now is that we have a lot of people who are entitled when it comes to preaching. We only engage with the word when we feel like, oh, that's actually good. Instead of showing up hungry, Instead of showing up expectant, listen, I'm a, in, the, in the words of the prophet Ace Hood, closed mouths don't get fed. And so you can't show up and start talking back whenever you feel like the preaching is getting good or you're like, I actually like this preacher, this is my disposition. If you begin to participate with the word of God as it's being released and engage in it, listen, can I tell you, 70% of Jesus' public miracles were initiated by someone calling out to him first. So wouldn't it be indicative for us to think that if you begin to engage and participate with the word of God as it's being released, I don't need you to talk back for me. I'm not that insecure. Yeah. 
I don't need it. I'm good. I'm going to deliver the word. But I believe something profound can happen in the room when you begin to engage with the spirit and the word of God as it's being released. You feel something on the inside of you coming alive, regardless if you're in the front, the back, or the balcony. You begin to talk back. That's good. Say it again. Preach it, white boy. Oh my gosh. If you got to get up and march around your walls of Jericho, if you got a holy hanky and you start wanting to throw that around, whatever talk back looks to you, I want you to know this is a safe place to talk back. Are you with me? Yeah. Are you? No, no, no. Listen, are you with me? Yeah. This is a safe. We're going to get rowdy tonight. This is not a place. We don't believe in bystanders. We don't believe. You, I, this is a safe place for you to stand up. Who likes to stand up in church? Is anybody right here? Let's just stand up. Anybody take your shoe off, throw it at the stage. You just get a little crazy. It's like, I can't hold this devotional anymore and chunk it out. Listen, I'll be dodging it. I'm quick. I'm quick. So you listen, I will not, we don't do quiet church. We will not. I believe in hunger. We talk back. We get what we expect. And so this is what I'm going to expect from you tonight. And so as we just get into this, I know that there's lots of people that we need to make sure that we don't forget to honor. I believe that any, anywhere I travel and preach, I'm going to build a foundation of honor. And I believe in the principle that a missed opportunity to honor is dishonor. And so right now, I want to honor Pastor Adam, who is a phenomenal leader. He's in the room. We don't honor you just because you're here. We honor you for what you've done, the church that you pastor, the family that you lead. Your investment into CF and I, partnering with the Lindsay family, being a voice for me, being just leadership and guiding these students. We thank you for just the impact you've made in the kingdom for a lifelong of faithfulness, a lifelong faithfulness, and just being able to you just see how you pastor your church and how you the city of Cedar Hill looks different because of you. And so, and, and all these everyone in here, whether they know it or not, is better because of you. So, Pastor Adam, we honor you and we thank you for who you are. I also want to honor the Lindsay family. They're not here. They don't need to be for us to honor them. And so, it's just worth recognizing that. This place would not exist without their faithfulness. I've been around a lot of prominent, influential people, but I want you to know that just being able to be near them, be around them, and serve under them, there's, I would say, next very little people who serve with such purity and humility and, and just servants' hearts than the Lindsay family from the, just any of them that I've gotten to be around. And so it's an honor to be at a place that's led by people like that. That they have not, they have not been jaded. They have not, they've had plenty of opportunities to be offended and to guard themselves, but they run this place with open hands and just the way that they've impacted the nations. It's rare. You could go to very few places and not meet someone who's been impacted or come from Christ for the Nations Institute. And without the Lindsay's family being able to lead this place for 52 years, not one scandal, not one embezzlement, not one adultery, not one thing, not many ministries this old can say the same thing. And so can we honor the Lindsay family one more time just for them, what they've done. It's incredible. There's one more family that I'd like to acknowledge in the room, and that's my family. And so I have my beautiful bride over here with our youngest, Marcus King. Um, and so we got three-fifths of the squad here. The other two are over at the uh, children's ministry that they do for T&E. And so because I have kids in there, thank you. I'm going to make sure that we end on time because I got to put them to bed. And so just as our family, it's uh, my wife and I. Her name is Yvette. We've been married for almost 10 years. I know. You're looking at me like this guy can't be older than uh, 29. I'm actually 30. Yeah, I know. I get that a lot. It's a common misconception. And so then oldest to youngest, we have Ella Rain. She is six going on 16. Um, wise beyond her years. If you have a conversation with her, she will get to the root issue very quick. She'll sit down with you. So are you dating? You are. Is he good? Does he love the Lord? Does he love you? Mm. And she'll just get right there. She'll just go ahead and find it. And then we have my middle son, my middle child, Maddox Ayer. Uh, he's, he's five. He's just five. He's, not going, he's just literally five. Run up to you, punch you in the crotch, and run away. Like, he's just uh, no motive. Just that's who he is. It's in his blood. It's just in his DNA. I'm trying to understand it, but I, I, I have to protect myself at all times. And then you got, um, you got Marcus, and then you got our dog, Walt. And so actually, you know, just sharing that about my son, Maddox, the way he came into this world is really just reflects his character and how he like, lives today. That boy was born in the backseat of our car. That's what I said. Ha, ha. 
Yeah. So I, I, I'll go ahead and tell you the story. I can't say that and not give you, I just got ahead. To, I'll go, I'm going to tell you that. What ha, see, what had happened was, we with Ella, precious, beautiful little Ella, you know, this is weird. Man, my hair is coming in thick. That's crazy. Wow. Trying to figure out, this is, you know, midlife crisis. I'm 30, just trying to see where we can go with this, figuring it out. But anyways, Ella, precious Ella, she, she is, my wife labored all natural, all three of our kids, but with beautiful little precious sweet Ella, my wife labored 36 hours all natural. She, I had a whole new appreciation for Mama's, Mother's Day after that. I called my mama like, Mama, thank you for all that you did. Like, what a woman could do. That sheer power, it's incredible. It's incredible. So she did that 36 hours. So with the second one, anybody who's a mother of more than one kid, they, they say that with the second one, it usually happens a little bit faster than the first. I guess your body's been like prepped, it's conditioned, it's ready. And so with us, faster can mean 24 hours. Faster can mean 20, 15. And so the night, the eve of when the due date was for Maddox, we had our friend over who was going to watch Ella while we would go to the hospital the next day. And we realized while my wife is taking our friend through the apartment just to kind of show her where everything's are, here are the clothes, here are the wipes, here are the diet. Oh, we were out, we're out of diapers. Micah, can you go get diapers? And I'm like, okay, I'll go get diapers. So I go to the Walmart right here, the, the, the one mm -hmm, right there. So, yeah, so I go to that one and I get there and I'm standing in the line. You go, they got, like, I got a question. Like they got 35 registers, but only two are open. Now that's the, the self checkout helps out a lot. But why you got employees in the back playing Wii, but you ain't got people to help check us out. Like that's just something I got to send an email or something. But I'm in line and there's 487 people in front of me to check out waiting to buy diapers. I'm on the phone with my mom and I'm like, yeah, mom, Yvette's starting to have contractions. She's starting to feel it. Tomorrow's the day. And my mom is like, Micah, she's starting to have contractions. And I'm like, yeah, she is. So tomorrow's the day. She goes, Micah, you need to know that with the second one, it usually happens a lot quicker than the first. And I'm like, mom, I've already had one kid. I think I know what I'm doing. So it's fine. I got this. I got it. Don't sweat it. And while I'm on the phone with my mom, I get a phone call from our friend who was with my wife. And I'm like, hold on one second, mom. I got to take this. So I switch up. I'm like, hey, Anae, what's up? And she goes, hi. Um, so like, yeah, Yvette's water just broke and it's all over the living room. And I'm like, oh, that's a lot of pressure but I'm a man of God. I'm gonna finish what I started. I got to get these diapers. So I look at this line of people and I'm like, excuse me. My wife's water's broke. It's everywhere. Can I please skip? And I'm like, God, I need you to part this Red Sea. I need you to do a miracle. You are a miracle work, God, please. And all of a sudden, they all kind of shrug. They're like, Ugh. I'm like, I'll take that yes and amen. My God is faithful. Won't he do it? He will say, cast this mountain into the sea. And so I get to the front of the line, get the diapers, rush home, take my wife, throw her in the backseat of our Honda Pilot, and I get on the road. Now, this is where it gets tricky. Because we live here on campus, we've been here for 10 years, we're ride or dies. We're part of the, we're, we, our kids, Oak Cliff, born and raised. We, uh, we live here, but the hospital that our insurance was covering was in Fort Worth. So for those of you, it's about, what, 40 minutes, 45, on a good, at a good time. 10 p.m. at night, 45 minutes. I ain't gonna tell you how fast I was driving, but I'm gonna tell you, your boy did it in 25. Can I get an amen? I was like, Lord, let the spirit of Ben Diesel, Tyrese Gibson, and The Rock be upon me so that I can get there fast and furious. You would too if you had a Hispanic woman screaming in the backseat of your car. Listen, I'm married into Hispanic culture. I knew what I was getting into. Where the Hispanics said, listen, oh man, the food is better, holidays are better, everything is just, everything, I don't know, I just grew up and I was like, I need a little bit more seasoning, I need more spice in my life. And so I had her in the back seat and she's, you know, like all a baby, ah, senor, ayúdame, senor, por favor. And I'm like, yes, God, do it, Lord. Please, see, say, Podway, we can. <laughs> yeah, viva, I'm just like, Spirit de, de Fuego, Santo, Viva Miento. I'm like, whatever words I've learned in revivals, this, I'm like, God, please. 
And so, you know, we get there, I swerve outside of the hospital, pull it up to the emergency room, and I just like slide it in there. I called ahead of time. I'm like, y'all, please be ready. Stat, this is happening. It's real. This is real life. And so the midwives, the nurses were all outside. They come to the car. They're like, all right, let's check and see how mom is doing. They get in the back seat. They check her, and they're like, oh, yeah, baby's ready to come right now. And I was like, right now? Excuse me. I called the nurse over to the side. I said, listen, I did my job. I got her here. You do yours and get her inside. And she goes, sir, baby is ready to come right now. So mommy's gonna push. And I was like, yes, ma'am. All right, let's go ahead and let's start this thing. Let's get it going. Within two minutes of me putting that car in park, (laughs) baby, Maddox Air came into the world baby juices came into my 2004 Honda Pilot. I was like, man, there's some things Windex can't clean. I'm gonna be honest. I felt bad. Like, if I'm ever gonna resell this, how am I gonna be honest with the person that buys it on Craigslist? Like, listen, yeah, it's a great A to B. It'll get you where you need to go. My baby was in the barn of the back seat. Don't mind the juices, but it's fine. It'll get you where you go. It'll do what you need to do. Like, I was like, man, but as I was just preparing for tonight, I really feel like that's a word for some of you that you have been waiting for the right time. You've kind of put God's plan, your destiny on a timetable and saying, when I find him, then I'll be able to make that commitment. When I find her, God, that's when I'll step into this ministry. God, when I graduate, that's when I'll start walking away from porn. God, when I step into full-time ministry, then I'll start letting go of those. And you've been putting God say, I want to do it at this due date, but God is saying, stop waiting. Now is a good time. Now is the moment. I feel like I hit something when I say waiting, waiting for him or her. Listen, you don't need that for you to walk in full-time ministry. It will help you, but I'll say this to some of the guys that I've seen work out in the gym. With the way you're looking at yourself, you will not find someone here in this season. Because some of y'all really, you're way too into yourself. The way you've been, like, y'all been looking at each other in weird angles. Like, and I'm like, I feel uncomfortable. I'm a grown man. I've been married for 10 years. No one wants to look at you the way you're looking at yourself. I digress. So hopefully someone received, or they just, they're like, yo, I'm never doing YFN. It's fine. They didn't want you. Anyway, so, <laughs> just, <laughs> it's too real. So that, for tonight, I really just want to get into the word. Who's ready for the word? Who's ready for the, amen. And so if you have your Bibles, there's two passages that we're going to be pulling from. We're going to look at real briefly. But I feel like my assignment tonight is to really do one of two things, maybe both simultaneously. It would be to irritate the comfortable, yet comfort the irritated to irritate the comfortable and to comfort the irritated. See, many of us, if we're we're honest, we have found ourselves, whether now or in previous seasons or future seasons, where it's very dark, ambiguous, confusing, almost like hidden seasons that we try and discern, like, God, why, why do I have this dream if I still feel hidden? God, why did you give me this gifting if no one knows that I have it yet? Feeling just that sense of being anonymous and not known. And I feel like that we have to be able to discern those seasons of hiddenness, those seasons of darkness and isolation and solitude. We have to discern whether or not we are hiding or if we are being hidden. I need you to think about that because there's really, the, the, the way that we respond to darkness really determines whether or not we are hiding or if we are being hidden. And the parallel between these two things can see, be seen in 1 Kings chapter 19. If you want to turn there, you can. We're going to read it real briefly for the sake of time. And then Luke, in Luke uh, chapter, I believe it's 23. So I'm going to read 1 Kings chapter 19, just briefly. um, Verse 9. There he, Elijah, came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah. And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. 
And then the Lord began to speak to him, and that's where he has an encounter where God shakes things and he moves things and he shows up in the small whisper. But when he says they threaten my life, which you need to know that this is on the cusp of the context of this, Elijah was doing a phenomenal ministry with lots of success, God moving, God stirring things, God revealing his true nature, but one threat from Jezebel sent him running and hiding. And he found himself in a cave and God shows up and says, what are you doing here? That's the first group of people that I'm gonna be speaking to tonight is I feel like many of you by fear or insecurity have hidden yourselves in caves because you're scared of what has been standing in front of you. Whether it be fear of rejection, fear of failure, fear of not being enough, fear, fear of qualification, you have hidden yourself away, preventing God being able to do what he was dreaming to do through you. Then there's the second group of people that I want you, if you would turn to Luke chapter 23. We're gonna jump over. You don't have to, I can just read it to you. I have a decent voice. <laughs> Luke 23, verse 50 I'm just gonna read this. Now, there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council, a good and righteous man who had not consented to their decision and action to crucify Jesus. And he was looking for the kingdom of God. And this man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen shroud and laid him in a tomb cut in stone where no one had ever been laid. It was the day of preparation and the Sabbath was just beginning. And so here we see Jesus being laid in a very similar context. If you compare the two places, both caves and graves, both of these places are dark, you're isolated, and you're lonely. So it's hard to discern what the nature of them is, but we have to look at, did we put ourselves there or did God put us there? And so what I'm gonna do is, the, message, the title of this message is Caves and Graves. Caves and graves, how we respond to darkness determines if we are in caves or graves. And so hopefully, I believe for me, man, I've lived through some life, and I think that I've, not that I've perfected grave seasons, but I think that I've had enough acquaintance with hiddenness that I wanna be able to, again, irritate some of you who have found yourself comfortable hiding in your cave, and then comfort some of you who have been irritated because you feel like you've been like the forgotten stepchild of God, and he for has forgotten about you in the shadows. And so I'm just gonna pray over you then we're gonna get into the word. God, I pray over every single person right now under the sound of my voice that they would be completely focused on your voice and your spirit to hear your words. God, that they would hear the voice within the voice, that they would, every distraction, every hindrance, every uh, obstruction would be completely eliminated right now, God, and that they would hear the perfect voice of the Father speaking to them, God, that every demonic stronghold, every attack, every assignment, everything that is trying to come against them would be silenced and broken off of them right now so that they can hear the, your voice and your words, God, that they would be, that, that those who have felt so frustrated and broken and just like screaming out because they're wondering, God, when are you going to bring breakthrough? When are you going to allow me to really operate in my gift? And God, that you would bring comfort to their souls. And for those that have been hiding and running, God, I pray that you would bring purpose and context, bring vision to the forefront of their attention, and that they would receive from you tonight, and that they would be able to walk forward with confidence and, 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 and clarity on what their purpose is in this season. And Lord, I speak to this environment. I command every demon to leave, every demonic stronghold to break. Lord, I pray that this will be a place where destiny reigns, prophetic words are released, destiny is realized, and your will would be on earth as as it is in heaven, in Jesus' mighty name. Everybody said? Amen. Oh no, come on, everybody said? Amen. Amen. And so when we look at the parallels between caves and graves, the first parallel that we have to make is this. Caves are all about self-preservation. Graves are all about self-denial. Graves, it's about I must decrease, he must increase. Caves are all about, man, I gotta, I gotta save myself. I think a lot of us, you look at Elijah, he came coming on the cusp of a phenomenal ministry. Some of the stuff that you and I pray for, we believe for. A boy was just raised from the dead. He just saw fire fall, fall down from heaven and consume a wet altar. All of the prophets of Baal are dead. He literally prayed for rain after years of drought and it rained. But then one threat from Queen Jezebel sent him fleeing. 
he was doing, he, after all of that, questioned whether or not God had the ability to protect him. I think if you're honest, for some of you, you've been operating with a false humility. You said, no, no, now's not my season. Now's not, no, I, I, I'm, not, no I, I'm not gonna try out for the worship team. No, I'm not gonna do homiletics. No, I, it's just not right for me. But on the inside, you're not doing it because you're scared of rejection. You're scared of acceptance. You're scared of being able to put yourself out there and then not make the team. And because of that insecurity, which honestly, in my opinion, I think insecurity is pride in disguise. Because out of insecurity, you forfeit the opportunity for Holy Spirit to work through you, completely eliminating yourself from the risk so that God can't get the credit that he would deserve. And so really it was pride because you said, I think I know what's best for me. And that's pride, because you're doing what you think is in your best interest. And as someone that struggled with insecurity, it was crippled by insecurity for years, I can tell you it's pride in disguise. It ends us in places where we are hidden and it's dark and we're isolated. And I'm gonna tell you right now, the lies of the enemy seem most true in isolation. That's why you need community. That's why you need people around you. Just to get out, stay on topic, self-preservation, man, that's when we know we're in a grave. That's when we know we're in a cave. When we're trying to preserve ourselves, insecurity or pride has, held, has kept us here because we don't want to put, get stuff out and potentially get messed up or not get accepted or get rejected, all these things. But when you look at Jesus' perspective, it was all about self-denial. I did not come to do my own ministry, but I came to do the work of what? My father who sent me. Everything about his ministry, everything about who he was, was denying his own will, denying his own ambitions, and submitting it to the Father. And that submission of saying self-denial, I must decrease so that my Father must increase, all of these things, he literally recognized it and epitomized the, the concept, a seed has to go into the ground and die before it can bear, bring fruit before it can bring life. So that what Jesus was painting the picture for is that self-denial or death is just the beginning. That you would realize, man, if you're in a cave season and you're trying to discern the being hidden and this why I'm not being seen yet, if you have surrendered and you have said, God, not me, but you, and it's still hidden, it's probably because self-denial has brought you there and you're in a safe place. You fully surrendered it to him. I think that for me, you know, uh, this is, I'm reminded of a, a story with my daughter, Ella. I think she was one years old. Um, we were on a pilgrimage to Target. And, and I know, listen, how many guys are Target over Walmart? Let me see your hands. Listen, listen. I would have thought it was more. I don't know. Maybe Target people are just sophisticated. They're like, present. <laughs> I had Target. <laughs> um, so we were at Target. I feel like it was God's, it's the promised land. You got the wilderness. You got Canaan. So we were there and we were buying our groceries, doing things. And as my daughter, she's in that front little basket area. And we were going by one of the end aisles and it had these Disney princess cars on it. And I think the sign said 10 or 15 bucks. And I was like, listen, if that is 10 or 15 bucks, I will buy that for you, Ella. And so she's like, you know, sticking her hands out, like, please give me, give me, give me, give me. So I take it. It's pretty big. I went to put it in the cart where it really would have fit better, but she wanted to hold it. She was so adamant about holding it. So I put it in her hands, and so she's like this. You got her legs just dangling. All you see is two little toddler hands and feet dangling and this big Disney princess car. It was so cute. And so we're going through all of Target, getting all our groceries. You just see her holding this big car and her little legs dangling. We get to the checkout counter, and it was the time of judgment just to see, okay, is this really $10 or $15? In my mind, I'm like, there's no way. And so she, the lady scans it, and she's like, yeah, it's good. it was $15 bucks. And I'm like, all right, Ella, it's yours. So we get to the car and I go to put it in the trunk of the car. And she was like, no, it's mine. I give me, give me, give me. So I'm like, Ella, it doesn't fit in your hand. She's like, no, I want it. So I put it in her hands in the car seat. So you got her little dangling legs and this big like Disney princess car over her. I'm sure it wasn't safe, but we did it. And so she's holding it there and her feet are just dangling. It's so cute. And then we get home and and we uh, unloading the car. We had all of the grocery bags. My wife actually took a picture of it on her Snapchat or Instagram back in the day. We have that if you can put it up there for us. So look, this is proof. It's as big as her. Um, if you're a, a mom and you see cute kids, I think you get the like tongue emoji, just like your kids are so cute, you could eat them, you know, like that concept. But look, I, so if you look on the left side, you can tell everything you know about me. I'm a man of God. 
I don't do two trips with groceries. I'm a one trip kind of person. Where are the anointed people that in the room? Where are the ones that will stand in the gap and say, not I, Lord. I will be found faithful when you return. Listen, I'm a one trip. I'll put all, I will lose circulation in my pinky to get the grocery. I, I've had to respond to altar calls for healing because I've lost all the circulation. So I got all the groceries on one side and then my daughter who would not let go of her new car in the other. I had, we live on the second floor, so I had to carry her up the second, all the stairs. Man of God, I'm telling you, I get up there, I do it, make it happen, make ways, not excuses. And so we get to the top, we get inside, she gets on top and she's wanting to ride it around. And it, I mean, you can see it has the box in it. And so I was like, Ella, no, I, I, have to, I have to get it ready for you. So I take it from her. She's like, no, mine, 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 mine. I was like, no, Ella, I got to open it for you. She's like, mine, mine, mine. I get it on the counter and I begin to get the scissors out and I begin to cut off all of those demonic zip ties that are, when, when Adam and Eve fell, God said, let there be zip ties. Because, man, those things are demonic. It's not of God. Some evil person studying witchcraft is creating these zip ties on children's toys. Because so, especially on Christmas morning. Parents, please back me up. So we, I get this on the counter, and I'm cutting off all the things, and my daughter has a meltdown. She was like, no, don't take it from me. And what I had to help my daughter understand is like, Ella, if daddy does not take your gift and begin to cut off all the things that would have prevented you from being able to use it, come on, if you're with me, if I don't cut off all the things that would have prevented you from being able to use it the way it was designed, you will never use it to its fullest potential. I don't know who needs to hear this, but I feel like someone on this side, every time God has put his hand on your gift, you've been screaming, no, 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 don't touch it. But can I tell you, it was never yours to begin with. A gift is called a gift because it was given to you. When God puts his hand on your singing ability or your speaking ability, whatever that gift might be, you have to trust that he is putting his hand on it for a reason. And that if you feel the hand of God being put on something of your life, whether it's a dream, a passion, or a gift, you need to trust the intention of the Father that if he is concealing it for a season, it only means he is getting it ready for the next one. If Jesus did not know the intention of the Father, he would have resisted the cross. But he knew, see what happens is that purpose, I would say perspective gives purpose to pain. And if you don't have the perspective, if you don't have the vision of the purpose in the season that you're in, the perspective to see the intention of the Father, that when he puts his hand on your gift, some of you guys, you came from a church where you were the stuff. Maybe it was from a family of ministry. Maybe you were the worship leader over your church. Maybe you were the, you were the speaker. You were on the preaching team. And you came to see if and I, and you haven't stood on this, this stage once. And you've been so frustrated talking to your friends about how it's not fair. You tried out. You didn't make it. Everyone has favorites. Can I su submit to you? Maybe it's because God put his hand on your gift to hide it for a season so that you could be build your character. That if you would be willing to die to yourself and say, you know what, it's okay if I'm not known this season. It's okay if I'm not used this season. It's okay if I'm not seen this season. God, if you have put your hand on my gift, I trust your intention enough to say, okay, now's not the time. This is what it'll do for you is that it'll liberate you whenever you come into a season when you're not, there's no secret sin. There's no, nothing that you're hiding. There's no secrets. You're living in submission to God, yet you're not seen. That's a key indicator that you are in a grave and that you have died to yourself and God has found you faithful and he's covering that gift. Can I tell you something? Who you are becoming in the process is more important than where you're going. Some of you guys, you've been, you've been so focused on that one prophetic word you got in your first semester that all you've thought about is getting there and networking your way there, trying to get on the council team so you could be in the green room when the right speaker came and to be around the right people. I tell you, that is not how you make it in ministry. You might arrive, but you will not remain. And this is being able to, if God, if you are hidden in this season, see, this is not the place to be discovered. This is the place to be formed. This is the place to be developed. If you've been waiting to be seen, keep on waiting. Keep on waiting. God has got his hand on your, this, trust it in his hands. He's probably preparing it in ways that you can't even fathom yet. Caves and graves, 
The second comparison that we could look at is that caves are all about retreating. Graves are all about surrender. Let me just paint the picture for you. In battle, retreating looks like what? Running. Listen, I've been, I've been doing a lot of running lately. Did 10 miles three weeks ago. Did a race. I'm feeling great. I kept at 8.59 pace for my first race. I felt good. I felt amazing. In fact, I felt so good, I just signed up for my first marathon. I'm super excited about it. I just want to share that with you. We're family. I can share this with you. So it's actually, I'm doing a half marathon and then a full marathon. Half marathons on Saturday, full marathons on Sunday. I figured if I'm going to train for a marathon, I might as well do the half marathon. I don't know if it's good logic. We'll find out. All right. Retreating looks like, like Forrest Gump. I've been running. I've been running. <laughs> like retreating looks like running. Surrender looks like what? Universal sign of surrender. Surrender. I surrender. I surrender. Elijah was trying to run from the problem in front of him, which led him into a place of darkness. Jesus was running, I'll put it like this to you, Elijah running from God, Jesus running to God. Both of them ended up in dark places. How do you determine the difference? Because Elijah ran there, Jesus was placed there. Again, if you are living a life of surrender, you can't hold things in your hand when you're surrendered. You can't keep things. You can't hold on to the ambitions, the dreams, the desires, the gifts, all the things that we can so innocently but unintentionally put before God, those things. We hold on to them, and then we end up getting in the way of what God wants to do because we never let go. This is, this is, this is so critical for us to understand because when we are surrender, what, what surrender does is that it literally, it's the conscious decision of you saying, God, anytime something comes into my hands, anytime I'm trusted with something, I believe that it is better off in your hands than mine, so here you go, God. So if you go from one season of being in a prominent position where you're well known to the next season, no one knowing your name. If you're living like this, you know you're exactly where you need to be and every season has a purpose and you won't allow insecurity or people's opinions to think you made the wrong decision. Because I, it was never mine to begin with. I've surrendered it. I've trusted the Lord with it. You've been living since you were 18 with a God dream on the inside of you that you would go and do this ministry and seven years later, like I'm speaking to someone, it still hasn't happened yet. You're living, are you living like this? Open-handed. It's been in God's hands all along. It's not yours. And so you'll know when it comes to fruition, it was God and not you. It was God and not you. You know, talking about surrender and hands, you can tell, you can determine the value of something based on whose hands have touched it. Right? You know, it's like a, Someone in my, my roommate uh, enjoys a show called The Bachelor. It's not me, it's my roommate. She's not here right now. It's a guilty pleasure. We're working through it. Pray for us. But Clayton this past season was crazy. Oh, now I'm gonna find out who's really saved in this room. Who's the, <laughs> I didn't, after all the people he said I love you to, I thought he was gonna tell me I, he loved me. It's like, Clayton, make up your mind. You don't know what love is. You got a deep wound. You got to work through this. You need a good pastor in your life. But there is at the end of The Bachelor, Bachelorette, you don't need to go and watch it to find out. But if you've watched it, you'll know. It comes to a point. It's a ridiculous concept. It's absolutely awful. But the person can decide who they're going to propose to. It's for crazy. It's really funny when you dissect it. But they go to a person to have the ring made every single season. One of the most renowned and infamous jewelry designers. What's his name? Not Neil Diamond. Neil Lane, right? Neil, ah, come on, back me up. Neil Lane, okay? He, if you've seen his work, ladies, if you've been waiting for someone to propose to you, look up Neil Lane's diamond engagement rings. That way you, What? I'm going to tell you right now, you, 
the reason they're more expensive than Walmart's is because his hands have touched it. It's because this person has put his fingerprints on this ring, therefore he can charge about $20,000 more than Walmart can. This is the concept of why at red carpet events and Grammy Awards and things of that nature, whenever they're interviewing them, they ask them a question. Who are you wearing tonight? Not what are you wearing, who? Because they will determine the level of quality and value, what the dress or the suit they're wearing based on whose hands have touched it and designed it. Can I tell you that if you are living a life of surrender and you have felt hidden, God's fingerprints are all over your life and the value that he has for you is only increasing. The val- Listen, if his fingerprints are on your life because you surrendered, your value is just increasing. So why would you not want to remain hidden longer? One of the best pieces, I, the pieces of advice I got from my spiritual father, he told me three years ago, Micah, remain hidden as long as possible. Not make sure you get this number and make sure you connect with them, network with them. They say this, don't. He said, Micah, remain hidden for as long as possible. He said, you only hide something for two reasons. You value it or you're ashamed of it. (laughs) You know, that thing that you don't want anybody to find out, so you hide it under your bed or in the back of that drawer. You keep it in your trunk. The thing that you don't want anybody to find out, so you hide it in those places because you're ashamed of it. But when you value something, you hide it, but for a different reason. You put it inside the safe, and you put that safe inside of a locked closet, and then you have a a security system around the house with locked doors, and then you have a fence, and then you have all these things, these measures in place, because you value it that much. So if you are being hidden, it means God cares enough about you to hide you so that you are not seen too soon. Your value is just increasing. Trust the process. Okay, third thing is this, the third comparison. Caves are the product, the byproduct of ambition. Graves are the byproduct of assignment. Ambition, doing what you feel is best for you. This is something that I have grown painfully frustrated with my peers because I found that there's a lot of what we are doing that is being practiced by us as young communicators, that if we are not careful and if we are honest, a lot of what we do, we can succeed without God. You don't need the anointing of God to go viral. You just need to know the algorithm. You don't need the anointing of God for your videos to be hitting millions of views on TikTok. You just need to know how to use the algorithm. You don't need to be well known around the nation. You just know which DMs to connect and hit and which people to get invited with. If we're honest, a lot of the ambitions that we have really don't have a lot to do with God. We just say, Jesus, I want to make you famous as long as I can be famous too. And I would say we need, especially if I can speak to you as Bible college students, those that are, especially for those of you who feel called to full-time ministry or feel called to start your own businesses, don't get to this mentality that you're going to do great things for God. God doesn't need you to do anything for him. I think Leonard Ravenhill said, ye must be great with God in order to do great things for God. You have to understand God doesn't need you to do anything for him. He wants you to do things with him. Assignment leads us to greater places of intimacy. Uh, Ambition leads us to greater places of isolation. This is the thing is assignment this is, I really want to hear this language more in my conversations with you as Bible college students, not where you feel like you can have a better opportunity or where you can be seen or where you can have your gift utilized. Where is your assignment? Because the reason some of you have never developed a real covenant friendship with anybody is because you've been bouncing around from friend to friend to friend, trying to get affirmation because you're so insecure and you have no covenant relationships and you're gonna graduate feeling lonely when you could have like stood firm with one friend, been offended and hurt, but choose to remain faithful and loyal. Some of you, you've been bouncing around. I can, I can, I've been here for 10 years, I can say these things. You've been bouncing around some of you people, I would say, I'm just gonna speak bluntly on worship teams, going to whichever church would put you on their Sunday rotation instead of finding an assignment and being planted there for all three years during your time here at CFNI. And even if you weren't put on the rotation, knowing this is my assignment, I'm gonna remain faithful. 
And the reason no one wants to hire you is because these leaders are smart enough to see you've been bouncing around to whichever place would give you a better contract labor. Whichever one would give you a better opportunity. And they haven't seen someone that can remain faithful. Assignment. I want to be led by assignment. I want to, I, I would be honest. I'm, gonna shoot, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to tell you like this. I believe the enemy would be completely content with you being promoted as long as he can promote you out of your assignment. There's a lot of youth pastors that I think should have stayed youth pastors that became campus pastors because it meant less work and more salary. There's a lot of people that went in to do certain things and they got promoted. I'm not saying all of them have done that. Don't please read it. Don't pick up something I'm not putting down. But I think the enemy, again, just going back to, he's okay with you being promoted as long as he can promote you out of your assignment. And I've lived through this. My, I don't know, fourth year, third year at YFN, I remember I, I got a phone call from a friend that I graduated with and he's like, Micah, listen, I started a business. He started a business and it became very successful. It was a million dollar company, like four years after we graduated together, three years after we graduated together. And he was like, I need someone to oversee this sector of my company. I want you to have it. Name your price. I'll give you anything within six figures. I'm gonna tell you something right now. I don't make six figures at CFNI. Okay, I don't. I'm gonna bust your bubble. Okay. No, I have nice pants on, but I don't make six figures. He said, name your price within six. I'm thinking, I didn't, there weren't any math classes here. One, two, three, four, five, six, nine, 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 nine. I can die, yeah. So I'm like, God, I've served faithful. I've served YFN. I've served the Lindsay family. I've served, you've seen me. You've heard your servant's cries and found faithful. I come home and tell my wife, babe, you know that black on black on black Range Rover you've been wanting? Girl, I got you. <laughs> it's yours, girl. Highland Park. <laughs> We're there, baby. Say the word. Which house you want? Like, I was just like, oh my gosh. You just start dreaming. Like, all the things. I was like, they listen. I was like, you just, you start dreaming. There's life outside of campus. And six different apartments in our 10 years here. I was like, I was dreaming. And so I, I'm sharing everything. He said we can live wherever we want in the country. He's like, we, this is our, what, what do you think? Like, you know, like we do the numbers. I got one, two, three, four, five, six. Seven. And I was like, oh, we, we just, let's just, and she's like, oh, that's awesome. I'm so glad he thought of you. I was like, I know. So what, like, what, do you, what are we gonna do? And he, she was like, well, uh, what did God say? I was like, well, I have been waiting for him to speak on the matter, but I have not yet heard a word from him. And she goes, there's your answer. My, la my Latina mommy, she kept it straight. She said, if God has not spoken on this, we're not going anywhere because the last thing he said was to serve here. So that's what we're doing. Listen, it's one thing to say that money doesn't matter, that promotion doesn't matter until it's dangling in front of you like a carrot. But do you have the fortitude and the faithfulness and the character and the integrity to remain faithful to where you have been assigned instead of being promoted with your ambition into whatever God is, whatever is being placed in front of you instead of being faithful to where God has planted you? It's, it's easy to talk about it now and daydream. Like, I would never, ever, that would never be me until it happens to you. Can you remain faithful to your assignment? See, Elijah was running from his assignment. Jesus was running towards his assignment. Both of them in similar places. How do we tell the difference? See, hiddenness is, places, is a place of development. Those assignments that you're in, and those are there to develop you, prune you, stretch you, hurt you, cut you, offend you. I want to know, who, is, who, have you, who has God assigned you to? We need to break this mentality that we only serve leaders we agree with. <laughs> you, need to, you need to serve under some people that you disagree with. If it's especially, if it's an assignment, I'm not talking about immorality, embezzlement, manipulation, these unhealthy things. I'm talking about get under someone that would disagree with a decision or how they would do with the expression of church. But if it's your assignment, stick with them because loyalty and assignment does not always look like agreement. 
that you would choose to remain faithful to a place even though you disagree, even though you may not see the full picture, even though you would do it differently. If you're assigned there, find a way to remain faithful there. Because again, in that process is where you will be developed. And there will be things that God will teach you in that. See, maybe it's a season of you learning what not to do. But you would never learn it unless you remain faithful. Maybe God wants to take you through the classroom of, hey, this is how you will not handle the situation whenever you're running your own company. Hey, this is how you will not handle the situation whenever you're pastoring a church. And it's the classroom. Because if you fail that test, if you fail that classroom, guess what? You're gonna have to retake that test in your next season. If you fail it there, you have to retake that test in the next season. And you're gonna live in this perpetual cycle of taking that test over and over and over. And then you'll find yourself 45, 50 years old, still wandering in your wilderness because you can never remain faithful to your assignment in the midst of disagreement. That place of development, I'm reminded um, in my senior year of high school, I picked up photography, like film photography. Anybody ever do film photography in here? Uh, a few people, hands, okay. So you can help me with this illustration. Film photography, if you want to get film developed, I still have one of my cameras that I picked up at a flea market. Um, it's a, I don't know, three, I don't know. But in, in these cameras, in case you've never held one in your hands, I'm going to ruin my film for this illustration. I know, it hurts. This is 450 off Amazon right here. Gallon of gas. So when you wanted to get the picture developed from your camera, you would, after taking all the pictures and pulling it out, taking it to a thing that they call what? What kind of room? A red room. A dark room with a singular source of light that is red. And then you would take the film and you would submerge it in these different solutions and you would have it completely submerged and you go from this solution to this solution to this solution and you would have to keep it submerged. If you pull it out too soon, it overexposes the film and it would never be developed. So if you allow ambition to get the best of your life, you could be seen too soon and the picture can never be developed of what your destiny would look like. If you allow ambition to, 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 to get in and it ruin and completely destroy what God has been wanting to do, the promises and all those things, it could get it and completely jeopardize what God has been trying to do in the process because you want it to be seen too soon. Instead of remaining faithful to the process, being hidden in a dark room and letting God submerge you Letting God baptize you. In other words, letting God bury you so that you can be developed. So that the full picture could be seen. So that when you are brought out of burial, in other words, when you are resurrected, the full picture is fully realized. The clarity is there. The colors are there. So that not only God, but the world can see this is what this daughter represents. This is what this son was built for. And it's not by accident, I believe, that God's hand is on everything. It's called a red room for a reason. So the only way you can see the beginning of the picture is seeing it through the lens of Jesus' blood, which speaks to the fact that it would be consecrated within destiny. You would never fulfill your dream outside of the will of God. That assignment, being loyal, remaining faithful, God, I'm on assignment, and if my assignment looks like hiddenness, I'm yours. If I had the time, I would spend all the time telling you how I went to intern at Elevation Church, thinking that I would be taught how to preach by Pastor Stephen Furtick, only to find out that I would be the project manager's assistant for the creative media department, and being the one that set up video sets and scheduling talents and uh, ordering costumes and being able to drive golf carts and doing, working 60, 70 hour weeks for a $50 stipend for a gas, driving 45 minutes one way every day. If I have time, I'll tell you about the grave story, the grave stories of being a student at CFNI, having a calling to preach at 17 years old, never getting to stand on this platform once and preach having a scholarship in the student informer, being known my entire time at CFNI as the video guy. And in my third, in my third year, my sixth semester, 
telling God that I'm gonna give up my scholarship, sat with my wife in my room, and we began to talk about how I was ready to let go of my scholarship just so people would not know me as the video guy, but as someone that could preach. And I heard Holy Spirit say, how dare you give up the very thing I gave you to get through Steve and I because of your pride. Coming on to YFN, not having a desire to be seen. At that point, I'm so used to being in the shadows that when 20, at the end of 2018, Pastor Chris Estrada, who was the director here, is leaving and says, I think you should be the next director. Me then going from my grave season to my cave season because I was so insecure that no one, that I had nothing to offer this generation. I wasn't ready for these platforms and spent eight months in hiding because of my insecurity. Dealing with my first anxiety attack, struggling with so much moments where I'm just so insecure with the way my voice sounded, how I viewed myself in the mirror, compared, comparison suffocating me. So I've been in both. I've been in caves and I've been in graves. I could spend hours talking to you about our cave stories and our grave stories. But I'm going to end with this. Our God is in the business of resurrection. But he cannot resurrect something unless it is buried. And some of you have things that you need to bury that you need to submit to him, you need to surrender to him. Ambitions you have to let go of and just trust his timing. Strategies, networks, and all these, just completely lay them down at the altar and say, God, I'm tired of trying to be seen. I want the cry of my heart to go from, God, I just want to be seen, to, God, I just want to see you. So if you will, would you stand your feet with me? Right where you're at, I just want you to put your hand over your heart. Close your eyes, put your hand over your heart. Thank you, Jesus. God, I pray over every single person that as I've been speaking and preaching, they have felt the weight of the cave that they've been in. They've realized that they have placed themselves in a dark situation. They've placed themselves They've retreated, they've, they've, they've been tried of self-preservation, have put themselves in this hiddenness. They've been hiding instead of trusting you in your season and your process. Holy Spirit, I pray like a good friend, you would just begin to soothe their soul. Begin to bring healing and comfort. Bring life. Like running water, just pour over them. Let them realize that your way is better. God, I pray for every person that has felt frustrated because they've been living with a dream, they've been living with a gift, they've been living with a prophetic word, waiting for it to be realized, but not knowing why it hasn't been seen yet. God, I pray that you would give them the kind of perspective that could only come from heaven so that they can find purpose in their hiddenness, knowing that they have not been found in this dark season for nothing. It's because you're adding value to them. It's because you are developing them. It's because you're getting your fingerprints all over their life so that when they step out, people will see God's hand is on that one. God, I pray that you would comfort the irritated and irritate the comforted. Real quick, with the few moments I have, there's a, just a few prophetic words I want to release. Um, there's a young girl over here. Uh, you just looked up at me. You had your hand like this. You just looked off like, Hey, yeah. Oh, what's your name? What was it? I can't hear. I'm just... Priscilla, Priscilla, I felt like this is just what I feel. I feel like the Lord is saying someone submitted to you. It could be off. It could be on. I'm doing the best I can. I felt like you, before you came here, you were like, God, if you really see me, someone's going to call me out. Someone's going to call me. A stranger is going to see me tonight. Priscilla, it's not by accident that God has highlighted you. God has literally put you on the heart of a complete stranger that doesn't know who you are or where you're from. I want you to see, I feel like God is specifically saying there was something that happened at 17 years old that has really disrupted your life and it's caused lots of waves of uncertainty and frustration and wondering where has God been. But I want you to know that God is with you, that his hands, his arms are wrapped around you, that he has a purpose and he has a destiny for you, Priscilla, that it is unlike anything you could have ever imagined. Yes, God can really use someone like you, every part of your story. So would you extend your hands to Priscilla, God? We just pray over Priscilla right now, Lord. The hand of God is on your life, Priscilla. 
God, we just pray that you would reconcile every part of her story make every wrong right, bring everything into purpose, bring everything into alignment. Lord, I pray that she would begin to hear your voice more clearly, that she would begin to feel your love more distinctly than she's ever felt it before in her life. God, that you would begin to move in such unique and profound ways that your plan and your love for her, your passion for her would be undeniable. In Jesus' name. I have one more over here. I think it's Tomas. Right? I saw you earlier. You're here. I thought it was you, bro. Um, bro, I saw you as, like, God highlighted you, man. I don't know where your dreams have been at lately as far as, like, dreams for the future, ambitions. But I feel like God has put a strong, like, CEO anointing on your life to, like, to lead, not just, like, inherit something, but to start something. Um, and I feel like it's just going to be one of those kingdom businesses. I've gotten to have a few conversations lately with a few people who are entrepreneurial their, their hands are to like marketplace things, but their mind is kingdom, and they're funding many ministries in the nations because of what they've built as a business here in the state. And I feel like that same anointing is on your life to steward a business, to start something that would have just be trusted by other businessmen and women that you would bring in lots of income, that, but it would be strictly to support, like that would be your ministry, is to support ministries. But I also feel like you have a call to preach. And so it's not like there's gonna be open doors for you to find your way into business seminars and to bring the kingdom into those settings. And so it's just very unique, bro, what's on your life. But I feel like, man, it's just the hand of God's on your life, bro. And he's about to give you just an idea that's gonna set you up and other ministries up from this. And so I just wanna bless you with that. There's one other word over here, a white sweater balcony. You're the only one that I see in the white sweater. Who are you? Who is that person? Jacob. Why, well, I feel like he, Jacob. I felt that. Jacob, I don't know if we can bring the lights on in the balcony. I'd love to be able to see Jacob. Jacob, are you a student here? No. Jacob, I don't know what it is. I feel like God really highlighted you. I want to say that what I'm hearing is that he has found, he has heard your hunger. That your appetite for the things of God, your ability to show up to the word, to show up in worship, to show up in devotion, not necessarily getting anything or hearing anything, but still showing up. He has seen your hunger, and I believe that he is about to fill you more than you've ever been filled before. I believe that he is about to exceed all the expectation you have had and that you've shown up with, that you are gonna be blown away about the things that God has gonna trust you with. Not like we're all gonna find out about it, man, but I feel like you're gonna to begin, to, God's gonna give you downloads of just secrets of the kingdom, things that are gonna be unlike anything you ever heard someone speak about or write books about, but it's gonna be just so uh, profound and deep and, 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 and just packed full of wisdom and kingdom insight. But I just, I mean, I saw you and I saw hunger. I saw just crazy hunger that you would be willing to show up again and again and again and again. And no matter what you receive from the Father, you're still hungry. No matter what you've never, it's like you're not going to live off yesterday's manna, but you're going to show up today expecting something fresh and something new. God, I know that you spoke to me yesterday, but that was yesterday. Man does not live by our bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. God, I want something new. I want something fresh. And so would you just hold your hands out? Would you extend your hands towards Jacob? Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I bless him as I speak that, God, that you would open up his eyes, open up his ears. God, like you said to the Israelites, open up your mouth wide and I will fill it. God, I pray that right now you would fill Jacob, that from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet, you would touch him right now, Lord, and that he would be walking with greater revelation, greater insight, open doors, that he would begin to walk in greater principles and understanding of how the kingdom works, that there would be more intimacy between you and him than there's ever been, Lord. Bless him and touch him right now in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen and amen.